This is a two minute warning. Reporters on the line, please press one to ask a question. Good afternoon, I'm Mandy Cohen. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for North Carolina, and today I'm joined by Director of Emergency Management, Mike Sprayberry. Monica McGee and Karen Magoon are our American Sign Language interpreters, and working behind the scenes are our Spanish translators, Jackie and Jasmine Matevier. I'll start with a rundown of the numbers. As of this morning, there are 68,142 laboratory confirmed cases. 912 people currently hospitalized, and sadly, there's been 1,391 deaths. Today is day to day, uh, so stay tuned for some graphs. Across the country, we continue to see dangerous spikes in viral transmission. Many states are now moving backwards. They're closing businesses again and enacting more restrictions. Some have openly recognized that they moved too fast. I'm grateful to Governor Cooper for his strong leadership to follow the science and use that dimmer switch approach to responsibly ease measures slowly. As you'll see in the data we'll walk through, we're, we are not in dire straits like some around us. We have reason to be concerned though. Yesterday we reported another record setting day of new COVID-19 cases. All right, let's get started and dive into some data. As a reminder, we use a combination of metrics that are based on public health data and White House guidance. Our four metrics we've gone over since April include COVID-like syndromic cases, lab-confirmed lab cases, positive tests as a percentage of total tests and hospitalizations. Again, we must look at these indicators as a whole package not any one metric in isolation because they each tell a unique piece of the story and each of them have limitations. Okay, moving on to our first graph. This looks at people who come into the emergency department with COVID-like symptoms. This is our earliest detection mechanism. It's taking a look at the yellow line here. You can see that this line is increasing. This metric is not impacted by testing rates or other factors. It's an early warning indicator. And we need to pay attention what this data is telling us and that yellow line going up is concerning. All right, next metric, we look at laboratory confirmed tests. I draw your attention again to the yellow line, the seven day rolling average, and we continue to see an increase in new laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19. As I mentioned yesterday, we reported the highest number of positive cases in a day, and I'd like to be seeing this metric level off, but unfortunately, it continues to trend upward. 
On this next graph, we're, gonna, we're looking at the exact same data of lab confirmed cases that we just saw, but now we're zooming in again for a closer look at the more recent changes. This graph shows data since May 15th and allows you to see our most recent trends in just a little more detail. Again, looking at the yellow line, our seven day rolling average, this metric is trending up and you can see it's accelerating and the slope of the line has become steeper over the last week. This is concerning. Not only are the number of cases growing, they are growing more quickly. And this means we're not only seeing more cases, but we're seeing more rapid viral spread. Now onto the percentage of tests that are positive. We want to look at this graph in the context of the other two graphs we just examined. And so looking at the yellow line, you can see that the percentage of total tests that are returning positive has been in the 8 to 10 range. And while it has remained stable, we'd like to see this be closer to 5%. So it remains elevated. Our next graph here is the trend of day over day hospitalizations. The yellow line shows that North Carolina's trajectory of hospitalization is starting to level in the last week. Our hospitalizations still have capacity to meet increased demand if more people become seriously ill, and that is a good thing. However, this indicator is a lagging indicator, meaning it takes longer to see the impact of viral spread on hospitalizations than it does on those other metrics we were just looking at. With our increase in emergency department visits that we see in our surveillance metrics, we will continue to watch our hospitalization trend closely. Okay, so here's where we are today. Our surveillance data continues to increase. That gets a red X. North Carolina's trajectory, uh, trajectory of lab confirmed cases continues to increase. It also gets a red X. North Carolina's trajectory in percent of tests returning positive remains steady at about 9%, but this value continues to be high. It gets a yellow line, and as we said, we'd like to see this number cut in half to about 5%. North Carolina's trajectory of hospitalizations is also leveling, but this trend gets a yellow line. We also track our critical capabilities, our ability to respond to this pandemic. And here, we're seeing mostly positive trends, and that's a very good sign. Testing has an upward arrow. We are averaging more than 20,000 tests a day now for the past week, and we have more than 530 testing sites listed on our website, plus additional pop-up testing sites. However, around testing, Commercial and hospital labs across the country and labs here in North Carolina are again running into shortages of important chemicals called reagents that are needed to process those lab tests. As a result, labs are taking longer to provide results. Federal help and action is needed to address these supply issues right now. We'd also like to see more federal testing sites here in the state of North Carolina. On contact tracing, we continue to hire contact tracers to bolster our efforts in our local health department and meet those ongoing needs. These COVID-19 community team members reflect the diversity of the communities they serve and almost half that have been hired are bilingual. Our personal protective equipment supplies are stable and we have enough critical supplies on hand to fill requests for the next three months. So in all, this isn't where I'd hoped we'd be for July 4th weekend. And unfortunately, we don't get a holiday from COVID-19. We can celebrate, but we have to do so responsibly. With COVID-19, that starts with practicing the three Ws. You heard them often. Wearing a face covering over your nose and mouth, waiting six feet apart, washing your hands often. This July 4th, the best way that we can honor our country is by honoring each other. Wear a face covering to protect your loved ones and neighbors. Wear a face covering to reignite our economy and support businesses. Wear a face covering so our children can get back to school where they grow, learn, and thrive. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Director Sprayberry for a few remarks. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Good afternoon. As we enter the long holiday weekend, there is no tropical weather in the Atlantic to be concerned about at this time. So that's some good news. 
You heard Dr. Cohen talking about our mission as teammates for the 244th celebration of the birth of our nation. We must all do our part by wearing a face covering, waiting at least six feet apart, and washing our hands frequently. It'll be easy to be tempted to gather and celebrate this most important holiday and throw caution to the wind. Let's not do that. We all need to remember that if we don't follow the three W's, we run a great risk of more virus spread. This is our chance to pull together. Moving on to some weather, high temperatures in the 90s are going to be with us for this weekend, and they're going to be a concern. If you're going to be enjoying the outdoors, please stay hydrated by drinking plenty of water, use sunscreen, and beware of heat exhaustion. If you start to feel weak or overheated, go indoors where it's cool and seek medical attention if necessary. Today is day 115 of the State Emergency Operations Center's COVID-19 response. We want to spend, send a special thanks to our law enforcement partners today. We know that many of them will be working over this holiday and we appreciate your selfless service. Yesterday, we completed our three-day push of personal protective equipment to school districts and charter schools all across the state. We want to thank the schools and our partners at the Departments of Health and Human Services, Public Instruction, and the North Carolina National Guard who worked so hard to make it a success. School nurses and other school health professionals now have a two-month supply of PPE and thermometers to get them started on the new school year. Help them keep their students safe and well. The state emergency response team is still filling daily requests for personal protective equipment from hospitals, long-term care facilities, first responders, and others. Just yesterday, we delivered PPE to 48 counties and one health care preparedness coalition. We also received 56 requests for PPE yesterday. So far, the state's committed more than $280 million to PPE purchases for the COVID-19 pandemic. As we begin July, we are one month into the hurricane season with five more to go. And it's time to make sure your family is ready. The state emergency response team and your local counties are preparing and you need to be personally prepared. Visit readync.org to update your emergency kit and family emergency plan and be sure you add items to your kit to stay healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic like cloth face coverings, hand sanitizers, and cleaning wipes. This year, we want residents in hurricane and flood prone areas to make an evacuation plan to stay with family or friends at a safe place inland or at a hotel. Staying at a shelter will not be a good option during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know it will be extremely difficult to maintain social distancing and to provide services in the pandemic environment. Staying with family, friends, or at a hotel will reduce the chances of you being exposed to or transmitting the COVID-19 virus. Shelters will be available for those with no other options, but they should be an option of last resort. Lastly, remember to observe the three W's, especially on this 4th of July weekend. Wear a cloth face covering, wait at least six feet apart, and wash your hands often. That's wear, wait, and wash. This is how we slow the spread of the virus, working collectively together. We do have the power. And as always, don't forget to look out for your family, friends, and neighbors, and to call your loved ones daily, especially during this holiday. Guaranteed, they'll appreciate it. With kindness and cooperation, we'll all get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Madam Secretary for questions and answers. Thank you very much, ma'am. Great, thank you, Director, and now we will take your questions. We'll take our first question today from Helen Chickering at Blue Ridge Public Radio. Thank you for taking my call. Um, my question is about the role of travel in new cases. I think at yesterday's um, briefing you were asked about uh, the role of people coming from an out-of-state or maybe out-of-county. In Western North Carolina, and you mentioned it looked like we're seeing most cases are linked to community spread. We're seeing a different picture in some of the counties across Western North Carolina, specifically Polk County has just released that 61% of their newly positive cases are from people 
visiting, uh, and I just wanted to get your thoughts about the role of travel um, in the rise in new cases, especially as we head into the weekend. Thank you. Helen, thanks for bringing up that topic. And yes, well, I was giving trends for our overall state, but we know that different parts of our state are seeing different reasons for viral spread. And it goes back to, look, when we move around more, this virus moves with us. And so we have to be vigilant at doing the things that we know prevent viral spread. It's the wearing of the face coverings, waiting six feet apart, washing hands. So yes, travel is a component of this, but what we are seeing over the majority of the state, that it is local transmission, it is exposure at job sites, then exposure at home when someone might get exposed at, at a job site um, at, at where they are working, and then they bring it home and unfortunately also expose their family members uh, and friends and neighbors. Um, so that is largely what we're seeing, but of course uh, there are other uh, contributing factors what we're seeing in the western part of our state is actually where we see the lowest level of new cases. So um, that, that's a good sign for our, our, the most western part of our state. But that is where they also get a lot of influx of folks coming into our state. So it doesn't surprise me to hear that Polk County is hearing, uh, is seeing a number of their cases come from outside of the state. Again, I think this is why we have to go back to those tried and true things that we know work to slow the spread of this virus around wearing the face coverings, washing your hands, waiting six feet apart. Um, we need folks here in North Carolina to do that, but we need to know, we need to make sure that uh, those who are visiting our state understand the, the restrictions and the requirements that we have in place and make sure that they're following those as well. Thank you for that question. Our next question is from Michael Falera with WFAE News. Secretary Cohen, Michael Flair with WFAE. Question for you. We've heard that Memorial Day was an inflection point for viral spread. What kind of bump in our trends are you expecting after this holiday weekend? And specifically, what would you say to young people who might be going out given the higher cases in that age bracket? Michael, thanks. Uh, yes, Memorial Day was an inflection point, but remember, it wasn't just a holiday weekend. It was also the start of our reopening or our easing of restrictions into phase two. It was the first time we moved away from, from uh, the stay-at-home order um, was at that same time. So those two things interacted. Difference here is that we have stayed in phase two. We have stayed in place to try to keep the, the level of virus level spread low. And now we have mandated and required that all folks to be wearing face coverings in public settings. So I think we have two things that are working in our favor. We're not having to, we're not seeing a new easing of restrictions as we also go into a holiday weekend. And we have new uh, requirements around uh, face covering. I think those two things will be protective, but it means we actually all have to work together. I think the restrictions and the rules in place are the things that are necessary to keep the virus level low. We all just have to do it together. Um, and yes, particularly those that are younger who may say like, eh, I can, I can beat that COVID thing. Well, you may be able to beat it, but maybe your older neighbor, that friend uh, down the street, someone at your church, someone who you may not even know, but at a grocery store, maybe they have chronic conditions, are older, um, they work in a long-term care setting. We all need to make sure that we are taking care of each other as we go into this July 4th. As I mentioned, I think a great way to honor our country um, and honor the United States is to work together um, as a state here and make sure that we keep the virus level low. Thanks. Next question is from Julie Havlock with the Carolina Journal. Hi, thank you so much. I wanted to ask if you are, have you revisited the idea of a regional reopening instead of a statewide reopening? Julie, thanks for that question. So we continue to look at our data, and yes, I think regional um, easing of restrictions is something that we will continue to consider. Uh, you know, I think the geography of North Carolina doesn't lend itself as well as some other states where they have some um, easier distinctions between where their urban centers are or maybe some of their other hotspots. If you go to our dashboard and you look at our um, 
our, our state map and where our cases are and you look at that per capita, you'll see it's in all different parts of our state. Um, there is really no region here. Um, probably, like I said, the best uh, is happening out in, in west part of our state, but we still have counties like Burke County who is having um, high rates of, of cases out west. Um, so I think all parts of our state need to be concerned here, but yes, we want to keep those options on the table, continue to look at our trends. Uh, we've said this before, but we know that viruses don't respect borders. They don't respect county borders, not even regional or state borders. So we have to work hard uh, here to make sure that we can keep the virus level low. Um, we want to be able to set a floor of the things that we think we need to do for our state to keep the virus level low. And then there may be individual municipalities or counties that want to go further based on what they're seeing. And that's always something we support because we want them to tailor to what they're seeing in their communities. Um, but we want to set that foundation, that floor for the whole state because the virus does move around um, so much. And so um, we're going to continue to do that. But I do do think that we continue to have um, thoughts about regional uh, uh, changes um, as we move forward here. But like I said, as we look at our map, and you can look right along with us, you look at, at that, we, we are really seeing cases in all part of our state right now. Thanks. Next question is from Lynn Bonner at the News and Observer. Hi, thank you very much for taking my question. This is Lynn Bonner from the News and Observer. If the state is going to see an impact from face coverings, how long will that take and how big will uh, the change be? What we sh should we be looking for? Lynn, thanks for that question. We, as we look at the scientific evidence on the impact of face coverings in other states, I think it can have a very outsized impact. Um, I don't think that that is something we will see immediately. It usually does take two to three weeks for us to see new changes in our numbers, either from easing restrictions and then we see numbers potentially go up is what we saw in North Carolina. I think when we take the action to do the requirement on face coverings, it may take two to three weeks before we see a dent in, in our numbers going the other way. So I think we still have some time here, but what, what's important about the face coverings is consistency. It's doing it all the time, all together, every day. And we can't let up. And so um, I think that is, that is hard. I know it's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, um, but that's what the studies show is that we really all have to work together on the face coverings. It's why we went to a statewide requirement for the face coverings, um, but we all have to work together um, and do that consistently. And again, we spent a lot of time yesterday with the governor talking about schools and the important of get, importance of getting our kids back in school. So I want to make sure that we're all doing our part to keep that virus level low um, and, and focus on getting our kids back in, into the classroom. Thanks. Our next question is from Lana Harris with WCNC TV, Charlotte. Hi, thanks for the question. Uh, this is Lana Harris, WCNC. So we have measures in place like the mask requirement and uh, we're still in phase two. Are you nervous that people are going to be going out of to different states uh, over the holiday weekend and bring back whatever they may into our state? Or how does that thwart what we're doing here if people go out to different states in masks? Lana, thanks for that question. And I know you all in, are, are close to South Carolina. We know that things um, in South Carolina, there are a lot of cases there. Um, what I would say for anyone who's thinking about July 4th, whether that's here in North Carolina, and particularly if you're going to areas where, the, where there's more virus spread, if you're going to South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, um, over to Texas, Arizona, it's particularly uh, hard hit right now. Um, what I would say is, is it's still the same tried and true activities that you want to take, take into account. You want to be wearing your face covering all the time. You want to be practicing social distancing and washing your hands. You have to be vigilant um, and really monitor your symptoms when you return. Um, if you're returning from a high prevalence area, really pay attention. Um, you should be wearing your face covering, right? So in case you have it, you won't spread it to other people. We don't have a lot of tools to fight COVID-19. Um, I wish we did, but it's the same thing. So whether you're traveling, whether you're not, it really goes back to those same uh, uh, tools here. And what we want to do in North Carolina is keep that virus level low. We don't want to be the cautionary tale that we see in some of uh, the other states that are heating up. I know that we can, can do that if we all work together. Thanks.
Our next question is from Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal. Yes, uh, this is Richard Craver from the Winston-Salem Journal. Uh, given that there's been a concern about the reopening fitness centers, also there was a bill that was that cleared the legislature last week that um, took out the Council of State concurrence requirements that pass with bipartisan support. And I was wanting to see if y'all have a sense for whether that bill will be able to be signed by the governor and what your recommendations are at this point. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate that. I, I know that folks are eager to continue to make progress on easing restrictions. I'm eager to do that. I know the governor is eager to do that. But we need to make sure that we keep the virus level low. What we've seen over the course of June has been concerning here. Um, we've seen increasing uh, case rates. I went through the, the data just before. We've seen increasing number of new cases day over day. Yesterday was our highest day of new cases. Um, we, we are, we're seeing an increase in hospitalizations. It was good to see that that was starting to level and we have hospital capacity. So we are not dire like some of the other states are on fire like we're seeing in other states. We want to keep it that way. And so what I would say is we need to work together to keep that virus level low and then we can continue to make progress in easing restrictions. I think what we've seen is that, that this slow and steady, this measured approach to easing restrictions is something that has kept our state from being on, on the, the worst end of the virus spread that we're seeing right now. So you're seeing states like Texas, Arizona, even California, not only uh, not move forward, they're closing things. And what are they closing? They're closing bars. They're closing gyms. They're closing indoor dining um, at restaurants. I don't want to have to go backwards. Um, I want to make sure that we can continue to make progress and continue to ease restrictions, but we need to see our trends stabilize in order to do that. So we're just going to have to keep watching our numbers and make decisions uh, as, as we go here. As we go into July 4th weekend, again, that's why we're, we're making such a big uh, emphasis on, on taking care over this weekend. We don't want to see these trends uh, really spike or get out of control because that won't let us be able to move forward and we'd have to move backwards and no one wants that. So I think we need to learn from these other states that are going backwards, that are closing the exact activities that we want to open. They're closing those. We don't want to be in that, that uh, scenario. We want to keep making progress. So we'll focus on the three W's and the, the things that we can do to try to keep viral spread low. Thanks. We have a follow-up from Richard Craver, Winston-Salem Journal. Uh, yes, yeah, so Secretary, I meant to ask you also, have y'all been tracing these fitness centers, the YMCAs and the gyms that have been doing outdoor activities to see if you're seeing any kind of concerns or outbreaks there? Thanks, Richard. So I think that was, are we following that some of the gyms are doing outdoor uh, fitness classes and other things outdoors? And yes, they are, they are allowed to do that. We encourage folks to get exercise. We know that's really important. And we know that when folks are doing activities outdoors, the risk of virus transmission is lower. It's not zero, but it's lower. Um, so you are both outside with better airflow, outside with UV light from sunlight, both of those things are positive. We also know that fitness classes are making sure to st maintain space. Um, they're marking things on the floor. I think all of that is really positive, and I'm really appreciative for those that are uh, heeding the, the guidelines and the requirements that we've put forward. So we haven't heard of, of, any, of any challenges or any spread of virus in those settings where folks, folks are really taking uh, these uh, precautions very seriously, and we want to keep hopefully seeing that and making sure that they're doing a good job uh, sticking to those good guidelines. Thanks. Our next question is from Brian Anderson with the Associated Press. Hi, Dr. Cohen. Brian Anderson here with EAP. Thank you so much for your time and accessibility here. We always really appreciate having you. Uh, I had two questions. So I'll, I'll go one and then a follow-up. But uh, my first question was just sort of on, on on what you said earlier about personal protective equipment supplies being stable. And and you said that the state has enough critical supplies on hand for the next three months. I was just hoping you could elaborate on that. Uh, is there any PPE the state doesn't have that it needs? And what specific supplies are stable? Thanks. 
Sure. Thanks, Brian. Yes, on per personal protective equipment, we knew this was an issue and supply chains were challenging before. Um, we, we now have the supplies we need to meet the demand, so we are supplying our local counties, sometimes our healthcare partners and others uh, for their needs, and we are seeing those supply chains improve. The kinds of things that we still had issues around um, were gowns, but that's really improved lately. And then when we look at what's called N95 masks, those are for our healthcare providers, there are different sizes. Those are kinds of masks that need to be fit for folks. We were seeing a shortage of small sizes of N95, so we've really focused our purchasing on making sure we get enough small N95 masks. So that's all been moving in a positive direction. So again, yes, we feel good about, about where we are, but understand that that's, we're able to meet the current demand. If we were to see spikes and surges, again, that's going to draw down our resources that we've built up again. We also, as Director Sprayberry keeps mentioning, are in hurricane season. We need to be planning for that as well. So not only are we trying to respond to current needs, we're trying to also build up our supplies to be able to respond as we go forward. The supply that I want to bring to your attention, Brian, that I, we are concerned about is some of our testing supplies. And these are the supplies needed at the laboratories to process the tests, the reagents. We have, we have swabs, um, but we need those chemicals. And what is happening at our, our health systems in particular, they could be running more tests if they had more reagents, but they're needing to, to actually run less tests per day to sort of save their reagents as they go forward. And what's happening, if they even run out, then they're using our bigger commercial labs, which further delays um, everyone getting test results back. And that's a real problem. So when we were, before, we were seeing turnaround times in 24 hours, 48 hours. Now we're seeing five to six days sometimes before people are getting their results back. That's not good. Um, we need to really close that gap. And that's one thing that North Carolina, we can't solve that problem from the state level. We need federal assistance. We need assistance from the supply, uh, the supply chain um, on this. So we are raising those concerns today. So um, while PPE, the protective equipment, we feel better about, um, it is the laboratory supplies that remains a concern. Anything you want to We have a follow-up from Brian Anderson at AP. Uh, thank you for that. That was that was very helpful. Uh, Governor Cooper said yesterday that you recently met with Bill Roper of the UNC system to discuss college reopening plans. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about when that took place, what was said, and when, if at all, the public can expect guidance from your department for college reopening plans. Brian, thanks for that. Dr. Roper is um, an incredible resource to our state. Not only is he the interim chancellor um, for UNC, but as we all know, he also um, is the former head of the CDC. Um, so we are lucky to have his guidance as we have been moving through this pandemic. And so he and I um, touch base often. He's part of our, our COVID-19 task force for the state. Um, and so I know he and he has a very large team thinking about how do they go about reopening. And our conversations are really about that. What are the things that, that folks, that they could be doing right now in terms of planning? And I think most of our conversations are talk about options and to make sure that they have options that range similar to our K-12 planning options. An option for coming back in person, but still having a face covering requirement, doing social distancing um, and washing hands, hygiene, the, the infection control, um, the, the, the washing uh, um, and the cleaning of, of uh, surfaces and such. So there's that. Then we've also talked about what does a full virtual option look like and making sure that's something that they have ready in terms of planning. And then there's a middle option of do, how do they bring folks back to campus and still do some hybrid of in-person and online learning. So it's very similar kinds of conversations that we're having with K-12. Um, and, and similarly, they need to be uh, working hard to get those plans in place. And these are, these are hard decisions on how to bring uh, everyone back safely, not only to protect their students, but to protect their faculty. Um, so we, we are sort of working through that together and we, we keep in close touch. Um, and I've appreciated his counsel and since uh, he, you know, he's had federal leadership roles uh, in public health for decades. So we, we continue to, to talk to often. Thank you. We'll take our final question today from Daniel Walton at the Mountain Express. 
Hello, Dr. Cohen. Um, I understand that the DHSS has been engaging with researchers across the state who are conducting studies about antibody prevalence for COVID-19 in different groups in the region. Um, I was hoping you could summarize what you've learned so far about with, from that engagement. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, yes, there are there are many research. Uh, uh, opportunities going on around the state. Some of them are in the epidemiology and antibody range. Some of them are related to, to therapeutic trials. What kinds of new medicines can we think about? Others are vaccine related. So it's great. I think North Carolina, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of study and research. I want to thank our academic partners across the state that have really stepped up and, and put a lot of intellectual heft and academic heft behind that. So um, opportunity to thank them for that. As part of early results that, that we have seen from some of the antibody studies, what, they, what those kinds of studies are, are, are asking uh, and looking at is what is the actual prevalence of the virus here in North Carolina? When I talk about the lab confirmed cases and we went through the graphs, those are only people who are actively getting testing. We know from other prevalent studies around the country that laboratory confirmed cases are really only picking up a fraction of what is likely the COVID positive patients or people here in, in North Carolina. So those antibody studies are, are helping us get a picture of how many people are actually uh, have been exposed to COVID-19, have had it in the past, and do they have now antibodies to COVID-19. And what we're seeing is while we are picking up um, you know, the, the number of cases, we're seeing a prevalence rate in a few of those early studies that range anywhere from five to six percent to up to ten percent in uh, the, the Wake Forest Baptist study was ten percent in some other studies I've seen closer to five to six percent. Again, these are all very preliminary uh, uh, results here. But what it's telling us is that there's virus here and there's a lot of folks who have been exposed to COVID-19 uh, here in North Carolina. And it, it shows you that there is a lot of spread of this virus when people don't even know that they are sick. And it goes back to these fundamentals, and I'm sorry to, to, to keep going back there, but it's so important uh, that we can spread this virus when we don't have it, which is why um, our face coverings are so important, why we continue to make sure that that requirement is understood, that we are wearing face coverings in all public settings um, when we can't be socially distant and washing hands and waiting six feet apart. So the research starting to tell us that, that there is more virus spread than our lab confirmed cases tell us, which we, we knew. Um, it's similar to the prevalence studies that we're seeing that the CDC has put out and, and others. Um, but remember, these, these research studies have to be done over time, or what's called longitudinally. And so we will see at different moments in time what virus spread looks like here in North Carolina. So I, again, thank our research community, which is excellent here in North Carolina for all that they're doing on both antibody and prevalence studies, but again, on therapeutics, on vaccines. It's so important that we as a state are contributing to uh, fight, this, uh, fight this virus at every turn. All right, with that, again, happy 4th of July weekend. Enjoy the celebration, and in honoring our country, follow your three Ws, and we'll be back with you next week with more information. Thank you. Stay well.